Hey guys, welcome back to week four. Thanks for sticking with me this long. So before we get going here, um, I want to show you has <clears throat> uh, been with us this far. So you can pause the uh, the presentation here if you want and take a look at this list that's loading here in a minute. Um, but all these folks are uh, have been following along every week and filling out the Google Forms and completing the assignments. So that's awesome. Our participation is really high, so that makes um, my job a lot easier. So thank you. Nice job. All right. <clears throat> so before we get going um, into the actual content here, the warm up, which um, hopefully we've already done, I, I wanted to go back and clarify some of the um, terms that we've been using in this. So there are three different words that you hear thrown around uh, so far, coronavirus, and then there's SARS-CoV-2, and then there is uh, COVID or COVID-19. So what are, the, what are those three? First of all, coronavirus is the term we use to describe technically a lot of different viruses, including the flu and the cold and it also includes what's causing the pandemic right now. So the pandemic right now is caused by a virus, which has a scientific name of SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus species that is um, infecting people around the world today. And that virus can, uh, can cause a disease in humans called COVID or COVID-19. So, Sometimes you can get the virus, SARS-CoV-2, and you don't get sick, in which case you didn't actually get COVID-19, but if you get sick, that disease that comes from that, like the pneumonia and, and the fever and all that is called, is, we call that COVID-19, okay? So anytime I'm talking about SARS-CoV-2, like in this slide here, I'm really talking about the virus that is right now causing the pandemic that we're all talking about. So from, so let's get into it. From last time, uh, we learned that there were that the spike proteins uh, needed to change in at least six places. Six amino acids needed to change to go from uh, to go from a bat being able to infect bats into being able to infect humans. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that um, that there's actually more than just those six. There's actually another seven that need to be able to change, but. So let's say it's 13. 13 total amino acids need to change for the virus to go from a bat into a human being. Okay. We also learned that one amino acid changes every two weeks. So 13 times 2 is 26 weeks to be able to make the jump. And a lot of you uh, used math similar to that in the assignment last week. You took the number of mutations or the number of amino acids that needed to change, you multiplied it by two weeks, and you got your number. But that is not actually the right way to do it. 26 weeks is probably not nearly enough time because remember that mutations are random, okay? Um, so there are a total of, in the SARS-CoV-2 genome, in, all of the, in, in, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there are a total of 9,250 amino acids. That's a lot. And for it to make a jump from bats over here into humans over here, 13 of them need to change. But which 13 change, or which amino acid changes every two weeks is totally random, okay? So it's possible that this process could take a lot longer, like uh, hundreds or maybe even thousands of years for it to be able to jump from bats into humans, and here's why. So, um, if we look at this right here, this is a spike protein. It's coming out of a virus, okay? And maybe these are the spike proteins that are on uh, that are on a bat. And for it to be able to infect humans, these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six amino acids need to be able to change. Well, a mutation could happen, but that mutation is going to be random. So the first mutation that that happens might be this one over here. And so this mutation does not help the virus infect humans, right? It's over here. It's a random mutation. It does not allow this virus to make more copies of itself faster. And so 
it does nothing, or maybe it hurts it. Maybe it doesn't even, that maybe by making that change, it can no longer infect bats, in which case that would not be a good mutation at all. And if we keep clicking here, the second mutation is not the one we want. The third one isn't. And eventually, after enough mutations, finally, one of those mutations ends up being the one that you would need to be able to infect humans. But that's just one of them. To be able to infect humans, you would, for example, need that one to change and the other ones here, 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 and here. Okay, so let's keep going here. And so because this process is random, it could take a long time before all of these virus, all of these amino acids change into the right one that would allow it to infect humans. So that means that this process, if we go back one, this process could take, uh, depending on what math you use, 3,600 years, that's a long time. And yet Bill Gates said that this was gonna happen sometime in the next 50 years and he predicted that it was imminent, that it was definitely gonna happen. So how is that possible? That it could, on the one hand, take such a long time because it's a random process. And on the other hand, Bill Gates said that, wait a minute, it's definitely gonna happen and it's gonna happen soon. Okay, let's fast forward to the next slide here. So the key here is the idea of an intermediate host. It would take a really long time to go from a bat over here into a human directly. But sometimes uh, an animal that's not a bat and not a human that's called an intermediate host can be sort of a bridge that allows the virus to change a little bit to go to the intermediate host and then a little bit more to be able to go into the human so that the virus doesn't need to change all at once to be able to infect humans. Okay, so an intermediate host makes the transfer to humans much easier. Not all the changes have to happen at once. And um, it makes an antigenic uh, shift. In other words, a big change in the proteins more likely to happen because it breaks it up into two stages and not having to happen, not doesn't mean that it has to happen all at once. Okay, so in the case of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 that we're dealing with now, it's likely that an intermediate host existed, all right, that the virus did not actually go directly from a bat into a human, and it all has to do with these guys here, the penguins, which are quite an interesting animal. So watch, let's watch this. The world's most trafficked mammal is one you may have never even heard of. The pangolin. Despite its lizard-like appearance, the pangolin is indeed a mammal. Some pangolins are as small as a house cat, while others are as big as a medium-sized dog. Pangolins are covered in as many as 1,000 scales, which protect them from predators like big cats. When threatened, a pangolin's natural defense is to curl up into a ball. Unfortunately, there's one predator that pangolins aren't able to protect themselves against, humans. According to some estimates, poachers have hunted more than one million pangolins in the past decade. Poachers use trafficking routes that span the globe frequently shifting routes to evade law enforcement. All eight pangolin species, found only in tropical Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, are now at risk of extinction. Pangolins are killed for a variety of uses, from medicine to luxury goods, with the greatest demand in China and Vietnam. Pangolin scales, often powdered or made into a paste, are prescribed in traditional medicine for everything from relieving arthritis to stimulating lactation. However, these remedies have no scientific basis. In fact, pangolin scales are made of keratin, the same material found in fingernails. Pangolin fetuses sometimes consumed in soup, are erroneously thought to enhance a man's virility. But only the wealthy can afford to eat pangolin, which is consumed in parts of Asia to demonstrate social status. 
In 2016, CITES, the International Treaty on Wildlife Trade, voted to ban all commercial trade in pangolins. However, these creatures continue to be poached at an alarming rate, even causing a devastating crash in Asian pangolin populations. Recently, poachers have increasingly turned to African species. The largest confiscation of pangolin scales occurred in 2017, which, according to one estimate, came from about 20,000 African pangolins. Making prospects worse for pangolin conservation, pangolins face habitat loss. Plus, they reproduce slowly, giving birth to only one baby a year. But why should we care about an animal most people have never heard of? Pangolin dealers are often part of the same worldwide criminal networks that drive other animals, such as elephants and rhinos, toward extinction. Plus, loss of pangolins could prove to be an ecological and economic disaster for local communities. Pangolins eat termites that might otherwise destroy crops and buildings. Pangolins also suffer abuses in the wildlife trade, such as force feeding and injuries from snares. A few lucky pangolins survive being trafficked. Confiscated pangolins in Vietnam, for example, may be sent to a rescue center and returned to the wild. There's a lot of work to be done to ensure the survival of pangolins. Countries must work to reduce demand and enforce laws against poaching. Otherwise, these gentle creatures may disappear before most people even know they exist. So, these pangolins, it turns out, uh, are one of the keys in understanding how it's likely that uh, coronavirus uh, can make the jump from a bat into a human, and that jump doesn't need to take thousands of years. In fact, that jump is potentially very likely. So to get from a bat into a human, there are 13 amino acids that need to change. To make those changes all at once, that's probably not very likely because those changes are random and having all 13 changes happen in a single generation, probably not gonna happen. But what makes it a lot more likely is an intermediate host. So the spike protein on a penguin shares characteristics or the proteins that are coming out of this cell of a penguin share similar characteristics uh, to a bat and a human. So it's halfway in between. So for the virus to go from a bat into a penguin, it only needs to make six changes. Once it's in the penguin, it needs to make another, another seven changes to get into humans. And by the way, humans are constantly in contact through peng with penguins through the penguin trafficking that's occurring all around the world. Okay. So um, the intermediate host is one way that it makes it likely that a virus could jump from a bat into a human. But a second way that makes it uh, very likely that, it, that a coronavirus could make the jump from a bat into a human is that bats don't just have a single coronavirus or even two coronaviruses. Bats actually have thousands, many thousands of coronavirus species, we'll call them, ready to make the jump or trying to make the jump always into a new host. So bats have a bunch of different coronaviruses that are just in bats and they're there all the time and they're always mutating, they're always changing. The spike proteins are always going through antigenic drift, okay? And so over time, that just means that there is a chance every time a new virus is made or every time a new uh, a virus gets copied inside of a host bat, there's a chance that that spike protein could change into one that would have the ability to infect humans. So intermediate hosts and the fact that there are thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of coronaviruses in bats already mean that this jump is probably likely considering that mutations are constantly happening. Okay, so let's put it all together here. This is going to be your last assignment for this, uh, for this unit. So it turns out that, um, that funding for pandemics, like the one we're experiencing now, in the United States has been decreasing uh, a lot. Since 2003, the federal government in the U.S., the United States federal government, has cut funding uh, to, for uh, pandemic preparedness. That'd be like 
getting ventilators ready and having a stockpile of masks and having the ability to make a vaccine quickly, we have cut this funding for all those things by about 40% since 2003, okay? So we're going through this pandemic now, but the question is, should we increase that spending? Should we be prepared for another pandemic that might come later, okay? So given everything we've learned about so far, we've learned a lot, I want you to use the biology concepts that we've talked about over the last three weeks to either write a letter, create a Google slide presentation, or maybe a video, and write it as if you're going to send it to one of your uh, elected officials uh, in the federal government. So that would be a U.S. Senator or someone from the United States Congress, one of the representatives, and I'll show you in the assignment how to find out who your representative is. I'll leave it up to you whether you want to send it to them or not, but the question is, should we be spending more to prepare for the next pandemic? So you're going to make an argument to them. And when you make that argument, I'd like to, you to use, think about the biology concepts we've talked about um, so far, right? Beginning all the way in the, thinking all the way back to the beginning where we were talking about how, um, how different individuals have variations and those variations can help them uh, make copies of themselves or, uh, or protect themselves from death and everything like that. So starting from the very beginning to what we know now through mutations and intermediate hosts, is it likely that another pandemic is going to happen? And if so, what does that mean about how much we should be preparing for the next pandemic and how much money we should spend to do that? Okay. Thanks for sticking with me to this point. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. See you later, guys.